Well, good afternoon, everyone. And once again, welcome to the first of our four part webinar Wednesday series. Today, Greg uh, Sihoy will address equipment design in relation to food safety. He'll examine statistics, facts and figures, as well as experience-based design changes that have optimized maintenance and improved uh, cleanability. So we have reserved some time for questions at the end of the session. You can ask, uh, you can click the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen and uh, we'll be able to answer all of your questions. So Greg, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Anna. And thank you everybody for joining us today. Um, my name is Greg Sehoy and I'm the key account manager here at DeVille Technologies. In my role, I'm responsible for uh, helping our customers with large scale projects. And so in doing so, helping each of these customers or with these, each of these customers, as with every organization, they have different challenges when implementing such large scale projects including the implementation of food safety initiatives. Since food safety involves a broad range of topics, today's focus will be on the implementation of process systems and how these general concepts may be specifically addressed in food manufacturing plans with the support of DeVille Technologies. To implement any process system, the selection of a supplier partner who understands the system needs is key to the functional success. For food safety initiatives, the field of suppliers narrows to just a select few who also understand the implication of their equipment with the overall process and operations, and therefore who design accordingly to facilitate sanitation practices. The right food safety partner will have the following characteristics. Food safety forms a part of their corporate core values as demonstrated by their implemented solutions. They'll have experience with strict product safety regulations in industries like pharmaceutical or dairy. They'll have the ability to develop customized engineered solutions to reduce food safety risks and have an application focus towards problem solving rather than strictly functional design. With, with R&D capabilities, they'll be able to develop new improvements to existing technologies and applying all of the above with a holistic approach will allow them to improve the well being of the entire system rather than simply healing the symptoms. With respect to product cutting and handling solutions, DeVille Technologies embodies these characteristics and is highly regarded for our focus on food safety, R&D based product innovations, and a problem solving approach to application based food processing systems. Our approach is based on 40 years of sanitary design experience through consultative engineering. Our partnership with FAM, a leading manufacturer of cutting machines, allows DeVille to help define the equipment or system requirements based on specific challenges. So fundamentally, although we are an equipment manufacturer, we'd rather, rather than simply selling machines as a product, our goal is to use these machines as tools to build customized engineered solutions to meet these challenges. So with this in mind, let's dive into the considerations for food safety implementation with examples related to product cutting and handling. Keep in mind though, that these considerations are transferable to other process systems that may not have cutting involved with them. So implementing a process system to meet food safety requirements can be viewed from different angles. In this webinar, the following areas of interest regarding food safety will be considered. First, we'll look at justifying food safety investments. Then we'll look at problem solving with the available technologies and solutions. Next, we'll identify some challenges associated with project specific installations, such as brownfield and greenfield installations or projects. And then lastly, we'll look at how food safety can be implemented at the grassroots level through new applications or new product innovations. So starting with justification of the investment in food safety. Every business exists for a common purpose, and that is to be profitable. For the food industry, the additional purpose to ensure that product introduced to the food supply is safe and reliable sometimes appears to counter this primary purpose. But a food safety investment has several justifications with bottom line impacts, including 
to reduce the cost impact of recalls, to generate cost savings on the operations, and to potentially increase revenue. So let's look at the cost impact of recalls. A direct result of a contamination event could be to recall the product. And this could lead to a decline in product sales. In addition to lost sales, which of course are only noticed over time after the event has occurred, the more immediate impact is a direct cost of a recall, which includes the notification of the recall, customer reimbursements, and product retrieval. In 2011, the GMA, the Grocery Manufacturers Association, estimated that these recalls co recall costs were between $10 million and $29 million. This data is taken from the USDA Economic Research Service report entitled Trends in Food Recalls from 2004 to 2013, which was published in April of 2018. Indirectly, a recall also has an influence on the product or manufacturer's brand reputation including the affected product and related products that are collectively branded. So this, of course, is an indirect opportunity cost that, that could be lost. So there are actually two indirect costs, which are the opportunity cost and the lost sales, and the more direct cost, which I've identified uh, earlier on this slide. Although other factors may contribute to contamination issues and recalls, Investment in sanitary design process systems can definitely reduce these costs. Sanitary design can be applied to individual machines or integrated process systems and refers essentially to simple design to make cleaning and maintenance practices easier and more effective to prevent cross-contamination of various products processed on common equipment. So simple design basically leads to two branches. One, the equipment or the system or the unit operations within the system are all easy to clean or become easy to clean or, or designed to be easy to clean. And that has the evident or obvious link to food safety. On the other side, having a design that is simple makes the equipment or the system easy to use. And that means that it's easier to maintain and has less downtime. So the operation will be able to keep up to speed with the operating conditions of the machine or, or on optimal operating conditions of the machine, which will lead to an improvement in the quality of the food that is produced on those machines or on those lines. The primary objective of sanitary design is of course prevention, but its implementation also facilitates cleanup and sanitation after a contamination event or recall, which will help to minimize downtime during that cleanup process. Production lines are often made up of disjointed unit operations, which results in, a different, in different sanitation practices for each equipment. A simple system design from a minimum number of equipment suppliers, ideally one single point of responsibility on the whole process, can make a sanitation procedure very simple and even common to every equipment. Here are two examples of unit operations that share similar design principles and that are typically paired together to form a system within a prepared foods line. What we see here is a cheese shredder. This is the FS40 full block cheese shredder alongside its um, prepared foods discharge conveyor, which would normally fit right underneath the discharge point of the, of the shredder to bring the, to have a continuous live bottom discharge towards either the end use uh, point or to a batch collection tote of some kind on a, on a prepared foods line. So what we see on the left-hand side is the shredder, which is designed to meet USDA standards and, and even higher, in fact. The frame of the machine, all the stainless steel, is in fact polished to a 32 RA finish or a number four sanitary finish, along with the actual design features. You can see the back here, all the covers are round, have rounded tops. The panels have sloped tops, all to prevent uh, or all to promote water drainage and prevent accumulation of product and therefore uh, eliminate the harborage points for pathogens as well as food buildup and accumulation. 
from a from a standpoint of maintenance, the machine is features toolless disassembly. The only bolt or the only special tool that's needed here is the bolt on the cutting disc, which is a pretty much a personnel or operation safety requirement in order to avoid having the, the cutting part fall off during operation. But otherwise, all the hinges are, are sanitary hinges, all the covers come off and can be very easily cleaned with minimum downtime. Similarly, on the right-hand side, we have the conveyor, which features a cantilever bed to allow the endless belt to be removed in one piece. So the belt, we call it endless, does not have any seams or welds in it. it this minimizes the amount of time required to disassemble the machine for sanitation uh, procedures. In other words, you don't have to cut the belt, which saves a lot of time when you're disassembling, and you don't have to re-splice the belt when reassembling. Other features include the same sanitary finish, this number four sanitary design, as well as the toolless disassembly. In fact, this conveyor was brought to the Listeria Learning Lab at one of the trade shows last year when we were still doing live demonstrations. And we had a competition at our booth to see who amongst our visitors would be able to take this conveyor apart in the fastest amount of time to a fully uh, sanitary, sanitation uh, ready position. And the winner was a non-technical person who was able to take the entire conveyor apart in 18 seconds. So if you can just think about that and imagine that, if this conveyor were on a, on a uh, shop floor and not on a trade show floor, imagine having a maintenance person being able to take it apart in 15 to 18 seconds, do their whole sanitation process, and then reinstall in 15 to 18 seconds. You can imagine how much additional production time can be gained just by having a simple design. So the moral of the story basically is, if it is easy to do, it'll be done frequently and properly. To reiterate the point I just made, sanitary design has the double benefit of promoting prevention and facilitating reaction in the face of a contamination event. So in other words, cleaning, sanitation, and maintenance will get done more quickly and with less downtime in both of the cases. So how do we do that? How, how, does, how do those two equate? Well, by having a lower cleaning time requirement, you can lower the cost of cleaning labor. Many um, manufacturing plants actually outsource to their, their cleaning to third-party sanitation services. And so if you have, spend less time or require less time to clean, you'll obviously spend less money in, in those services. By reducing the setup and maintenance time, you'll also, of course, reduce the labor cost to the maintenance crew. They could be spending their time doing other more beneficial activities. From a spare parts consideration, this goes back to the simple design aspect of making it easy to inspect and making it easy to access the equipment. The easier it is to do those two activities, the better and more robust the equipment will be and the better condition they'll always be in. And therefore you'll have a lower turnover of spare parts and spend less money managing and maintaining the spare parts inventory. And finally, with an application-based design or purpose-built solutions, we can actually lower food waste because the equipment will be designed specifically for that application without the need, without the uh, ramification of over spillage for one, or lower yields, lost food uh, on the floor or um, inaccurate or imprecise, uh, in the case of food cutting, uh, cut profiles that result in lost product or unacceptable quality product. What that will lead to, of course, is a lowering of raw material cost. You don't have to buy as much feed in order to generate the production requirements that are needed or the production demand that is needed. So here's an example of how we achieve those four points. This is the Sure Shred 16 cutting head. 
that is designed specifically, so it's an application-based design specifically for cheese. It has um, steps welded, uh, not welded, sorry, uh, machined right into the rim of the head to set, to preset the thickness between the, each of the segments so that you have a consistent uh, cut thickness of the product coming, coming out. So in this case, cheese, you'll have a consistent cheese thickness all the time. So that contributes to higher yield and therefore lower food waste. On a robustness side, the individual independent segments are designed with an improvement to the knife clamp. So the knife clamp actually offers a much more stable and consistent knife force or clamping force on the knife. And what this does is it prevents buildup of cheese underneath the clamp, as well as preventing the knife from slipping underneath so that during the operation, you always have um, a uniform contact between the knife and the product. So you don't have uneven wear on the knife. You have a longer lifespan of the knife and therefore lower spare parts. From a setup standpoint, because of the independent knife um, the segments, it takes less time to set up an entire head. It's what we call the set and forget setup. Uh, capability or set and forget design. So it actually takes, so firstly you have the independent segment. So if you break a knife or a knife wears out and not all the knives are, are worn out to the same degree and you only want to change one knife, you can access just one segment without having to undo the entire head, which is the case in more traditional centrifugal cutting heads. Additionally, because of the steps that are machined into the rim, you don't have the um, set screws that are needed to tune the thickness and make adjustments to the, vari to the variability on the, on the thickness of, of the cut. So all you have to do is put in the segment and the knife, clamp it down, tighten down the bolt, and you're ready to go, especially with the help of this, um, of this uh, mounting tool that allows the head to be set up and allows it to spin freely from one segment to the next. So it actually takes less than a minute to set up one of these segments. And so with 16 cutting, station, cutting stations, it takes about 15 minutes to set up one of these heads in comparison to the traditional heads that have the tuning keys that you need to use to tune the thickness once, twice, or even three times around to ensure that you have the proper setting, which needs to be obviously redone as the pressure of cutting changes and allows that uh, set up to some time. So on the traditional head, you may have 30 minutes or 45, sometimes even up to an hour setup time in comparison to the set and forget system of the Sure Shred 16 head, which takes only 15 minutes to set up. And then on the cleaning time, you can see that because of the independent segments and the lower number of parts on each segment, you only have the segment itself, the knife clamp and the knife, it is much easier to disassemble, takes less time, and therefore lower cost to clean. Another example is the dicing of tomatoes. In this slide, we show on the left-hand side a traditional dicer, and on the right-hand side, a Treatise 240 uh, dicer that has adaptations or application-specific adaptations made to it specifically for tomatoes. What we show here is that on the traditional dicer, you have a flat top shelf that allows buildup and accumulation of tomatoes. You have a lot of juice loss because of the way that the, the drum is set up. You have a lot of uh, lo juice loss and leakage out of the drum. And you have high levels of housekeeping that are required because of the dripping out of the chute and out of the drum of all that tomato juice. In comparison with those adaptations, to the treatise, you can see the left-hand side, there's no buildup on the frame, and there's only a couple of spots coming out of the, um, the chute. And this was on, the, the, these photos were taken actually on a, during a trial where both machines are set up simultaneously or side by side on the same line. So they were receiving the same quality of tomatoes off the same feed conveyor. So this is a true side by side comparison, and you can see the difference in, um, in cleanability. So the treatise 240, improves, provides improvements in housekeeping, 
yield increase, and buildup and accumulation. So to the last point for justification of, um, of the investment, we look at the increased potential of revenue. In food manufacturing, revenue is linked to the production volume, or in other words, the number of clients that can be serviced, and the product quality, which is a value add to, a, to the product comparatively to a, a similar product or a competitive product, which may be available on the market. Sanitary design process systems have a direct impact on these factors, owing to a holistic focus on food safety, reliability, and consistency. A sanitary design processing system must have all three criteria to succeed in its purpose. So by investing in sanitary design and demonstrating the ability to meet these criteria, food manufacturers can create heightened customer confidence and attract new business. So in other words, if you build it, they will come. So this is an example of one of our customers that installed a GAPSET 16 cutting head on their broccoli stems to make broccoli slaw. And how by changing the quality of their product, they increase their potential to gain more clients. So on this photo, you see two piles of slaw. On the left-hand side, you see the pile that was made using the GAPSET 16 head. And on the right-hand side, the existing cutting head or the previous cutting head that they had before. So on the left-hand side, you, you can actually see even from this far away, the distinctiveness of each shred and the cut profile, the cross section, and how each one is consistent and distinct and uniform. On the right-hand side, the pile is a lot more randomized. There's a lot more uh, variability in the product profile, as well as a lot of fines generated. You see a lot of small pieces and a lot of loss of product. And what the customer told us uh, is what is quoted here. We have seen an improvement on the capacity as well as the quality coming from the modified CC cutter. There has been an improvement. There's also been an improvement with blade wear. Previously, we would replace blades almost daily whereas the new head has yet to need a blade replacement in the week that it has been running. And just to do a zoom in on the quality of the product, we can see the broccoli, you can see broccoli on the left-hand side, and you can actually see the distinctiveness of each um, strand or each shred. And similarly, when you run it on a different product, on carrots on the right-hand side, you see a very similar result because of that set and forget system that, is, that allows you to have a consistent cut regardless of the operation that you're, uh, that you're running. So let's move over to chapter two, which is problem solving with, with the technology. Technology in general has a single historical purpose to make human life easier. The common problems addressed by technology can be summarized into three categories. To reduce manual labor, two, to speed up repetitive tasks, and three, to increase quality of product. For example, James Watt's steam engine was introduced into the textiles industry in the late 1800s to address exactly these nuisances on the shop floor. For today's food industry though, food industry, these three categories translate to automation to simplify the line operations, higher capacity to meet growing product demands, and three, consistent product texture and flavor, all supported by a food safety mindset or uh, wrapped all together by food safety, caught in the food safety net, if you will. In other words, the process machine or system needs to be functional. So these three categories address the functionality of the system while being designed with food safety in mind. So let's look at the Treatise 240 Dicer for fruits and vegetables dicing as an example of how each of these three categories can be addressed using new and improved technology. So look, looking, looking at the automation category, the Treatise 240 can be installed with a slip detection system. So before we get into what that is, we need to take a back step to, to the three-stage active crash protection system that is included on every Treatise 240 machine that, that is built. First, 
you have a slipper clutch built into the main impeller gear on the shaft of that gear. The impeller uh, is, is the main driver inside the drum of the, uh, of the rotary dicer. And if a foreign contaminant or a foreign material, a bolt or a rock or something enters into that drum and gets caught in it, the slipper clutch will disengage and allow the motor to free spin, thereby preventing the impeller from driving and crashing all the knives into each other. So you not only save the motor, but you also save all the cutting tools on the knife side. The second stage is if that foreign material happens to pass through that first stage and into the circular knives and, and jams up the circular knife, you can't see it in these photos, but there is a uh, plastic coupling that, that connects the shaft or the, the drive shaft to the main spindle. And that is a sacrificial inexpensive coupling to replace. And thirdly, if the first two stages get bypassed by the foreign material and gets caught in the cross cut, then you'll have the timing belt that can break and that is inexpensive and easy to replace. So back to that first stage where you have the slipper clutch located on the shaft of the main impeller gear. This can be equipped with the automated slip detection system. Without this system, the operator would have to be keenly aware that a crash has occurred and that product is overspilling the machine and backing up the upstream feed conveyor. With the sensors installed, so one on the shaft and one on the main gear itself, you can actually detect the differential speed between those two components. And what this will lead to is an automatic shutdown of the machine and even an emergency interlocking of the upstream conveyor to prevent cascading of, the, of operational issues. This system therefore lends itself well to a complete automated processing line. To address the capacity category, the Treatise 240 has redesigned cutting details that enable up to 40% more capacity than similar traditional dicers. Up to 30,000 pounds an hour on hard products such as root vegetables at 3 eighths of an inch dice dimensions. This capacity rate is achieved by running a faster impeller at 203 RPM compared with the traditional 140 to 150 RPM while maintaining superior cut quality due to a shorter product path through the cutting zone, which allows the product to have less opportunity to twist, turn, and pull through the unit. From a sanitation perspective, we should also look at the outboard motor, the five horsepower stainless steel motor, which is a fully washed down capable device. And of course, there's the capacity note, 30,000 pounds an hour on three eighths of an inch dice. The same redesign principle on the cutting tools allows, that allows a higher capacity also allows the Treatise 240 to ge generate a superior cut quality to reduce damage to the cut product due to cellular breakage. In this example, with the customized adaptations to the Treatise 240 for tomatoes, we can see right here in the photo on the right-hand side, an improvement to the uniformity and consistency of the dice, and therefore an improvement to shelf life texture and flavor, and therefore overall customer taste experience. Without the adaptations and with a more traditional dicer, you can see on the left-hand side, the crushed tomatoes, a lot of juice loss, and therefore a lot of cellular breakage. On the right-hand side, you can see the distinctiveness of each dice and the implied retention of juice within the dice for, an impactful, for a more impactful flavor. So onto the third section, food safety criteria vary for different plants or projects, which means that flexibility or that a solution will require flexibility and customization. In other words, one size does not fit all. The level of customization could involve equipment design, process line arrangement, or a combination of both, and is dependent on whether the project is greenfield or brownfield. Due to high capex requirements, greenfield projects, projects are more uncommon, but from a food safety perspective, may be easier to implement. Since a greenfield project builds on brand new infrastructure, 
a process line can be built around standard equipment with pre-existing food safety specifications, such as the 10 principles of sanitary design and using various equipment design scoring checklists. So the food safety challenges of a greenfield project actually lean more heavily on process line arrangement, requiring answers to questions such as, where should the line be placed to avoid contamination from ventilation points, drainage areas, personnel interaction, or human vehicle traffic? How should the line be placed to facilitate access for maintenance and cleaning? And what is the most optimal line setup to minimize product losses in case of a positive, detect positive detection? In other words, greenfield projects rely on system customization to meet optimized process operations. So here's an example of a project that DeVille got involved with that was a greenfield project. We had a blank slate to work from. And so we were able to select equipment and build a system that was optimized for food safety and place it in such an arrangement that made the process flow and the process operations a lot more simple. What this shows here is on the continuous line down at the bottom, this was a, a fresh vegetables cutting line. We had a bin dumper and a receiving conveyor along with the cross waste removal conveyor across each of the lines feeding towards a high capacity cutter, which then discharged into the wash flume line, into the conveyor and, and spin dryer to a conveyor and a uh, collection conveyor that moved into, the, into a blender to blend all the ingredients together with, with the continuous line ingredients to the batch ingredients on the other lines. So it was, very, it was a lot easier to implement because we had a blank slate. Comparatively, a brownfield project may be much more challenging for food safety implementation due to pre-existing conditions, culture, and processes. These projects require compromise between the food safety, engineering, and operations groups with consultations with creative open-minded process suppliers. Some of these compromises might include redesign or reconfiguration of equipment, such as feed points, discharge points, or, con or control locations, and that would fall in the responsibility of the process supplier or the equipment supplier. You could have relaxation of the equipment design specifications, which would be the responsibility of the food safety group to decide whether or not they could accept those, those changes. You can accept non-ideal equipment or non-ideal uh, non equipment arrangements or have functionality limitations. And that would be the engineering group that would have to make those uh, sacrifices. And finally, re-evaluation of sanitation or operating procedures to meet all of the, uh, these above limitations. And that would be the operations group that would be part of that. So in sum, what it basically takes to implement food safety on a brownfield project is a holistic uh, team effort amongst all of the groups. We can't all have our own agendas to meet. This is a project that DeVille was involved in uh, or asked to evaluate anyway, um, to implement a food safety uh, or a food safe or more, uh, more higher, I'm uh, sorry, equipment with higher sanitary design for high capacity cutting and conveying leading into the cutter. As you can see, they had a, a large bin dumper and a receiving conveyor, as well as a spaghetti layout in a tight space with limited access to the plant with the doors located very close to the equipment in which to fit new equipment. So this equipment as shown here was the existing equipment. And the challenge was to figure out how do you fit sanitary design equipment into the same space occupied by less sanitary equipment. So that was a, a major challenge that we needed to work together with the whole team to try to figure out. So at this point, we've looked at how to implement food safety by justifying the investment, solving a problem using customized or adapted technologies, and comparing the different challenges of greenfield and brownfield projects. So to finish this presentation, let's look at one more avenue of food safety impl implementation through new product innovations. 
From a grassroots perspective, food safety can be implemented at the developmental stages of a new product. Through partnerships, vendors equipped with test kitchens and process testing facilities for trial and error development. In parallel to process functionality and product evaluation, the process equipment and the systems can be tested for food safety specifications in a holistic manner in parallel to the, all that development of the actual product. So this allows a manufacturer to make adaptations or to develop redesigns to the equipment based on the application specific requirements. So a few examples of some of the product innovations that we were asked to try to develop while keeping our minds focused on how we would do this at an industrial scale. So this includes an example like rice cauliflower, which is a gluten-free um, alternative to, to rice. So this is a product that we, we worked with a client on. And this was a fluffy product because we had the florets. It gives you kind of that randomized look and is a suitable for, uh, for replacing rice. We've worked on redevelopments of our cutting discs or our cutting tools on our dicers and shredders to produce products like sh uh, shaved Parmesan or crumbled feta. We've also worked on alternatives to pasta, such as rotini cut vegetables. On the left-hand side here, we have carrots, and on the right-hand side, we have squash, as well as the longer type vegetable linguine. On the top left, we have sweet potato. On the top right, we have zucchini. And on the bottom, we have squash. So a lot of new applications can be developed in tandem with the development of new equipment and new industrial scale equipment in order to attempt to commercialize these new innovations. So that brings me to the end of the presentation. As Anna mentioned earlier, we have time now to do a Q&A session. Of course, if there are no questions or if questions are, uh, are not asked, but are, um, or that we come up with questions after the session has ended, you can always reach out to us at, this, at these uh, coordinates and we'd be happy to, to answer those questions later on. But let's open the floor now to some questions if there are any. Uh, 